Yeah, thank you very much for the very nice introduction. I would also like to thank the organizers very much for inviting me. It's always a great pleasure here to be here at IPAM. Now, I think we all know how tremendously successful deep neural networks are, but at the same time, we also know that they are more or less still like a black box. So we have a huge lack of a theoretical understanding of those. And so there are interpretability methods to uh, try to understand, if we have already a trained neural network, how this network acts, and in some sense also validate uh, the action of the neural network. So this is mostly done for classification. So for instance, we have images which, where we reach a classification decision, and then we understand which input features are most relevant for this decision. And we already heard a beautiful talk in the morning on this by Klaus Robert Müller. Now, from my perspective, um, yeah, as a mathematician, as John already said, um, what we aim to do is to develop a method which has a more rigorous mathematical foundation so that you can also then drive the theory of this further. So in particular, if you um, have a classification decision of an, imp of an image and you would like to know which pixels are most relevant for the decision, the question is what does relevant actually mean? What does it mean mathematically, not just intuitively? Uh, and so with this uh, information theoretic approach, we hope that we can contribute uh, in this direction. And so this is what I would like to discuss with you. And then in the second part, I will all, would also like to discuss, certainly, I mean, for classification decisions, we then have, in some sense, an understanding of interpretability. But deep neural networks are not only used for classification. They are also used for problems like inverse problems or not also partial differential equations. And so the question is, what does interpretability mean in that sense? And that's a huge, I think, to my mind, open field. And so most of what I would like to discuss with you, in particular the first part, is uh, John work with uh, Stefan Welchen, Jan McDonald, and Sascha Hauch, who are three very bright students from my group. Yeah, I mean, we all know deep neural, deep neural networks are all around us, will be even more in the future, self-driving cars, surveillance tasks, also legal issues. Uh, often, or maybe not often, but I mean sometimes job applications are pre-screened by using neural networks and the whole healthcare sector. So what we see is, I mean, these are very sensitive issues. Um, so this makes it even worse that we are still lacking a foundational theoretical understanding of how neural networks act and why they reach decision, why their, where the outcome in some sense, um, how it is evaluated. Now, this lack of a theoretical understanding was last year actually very uh, in an interesting event, let's say, discussed by Ali Rahimi here actually in California. There was a big conference um, and he gave a plenary talk there. And as it says, he took a swipe at his field and even received an ovation for it. Um, he said that machine learning algorithms in which computers learn through trial and error have become a form of alchemy. Researchers do not know why some algorithms work and others don't, nor do they have rigorous criteria for choosing one AI architecture over another. And then there was a big discussion of to which extent we already have sufficient knowledge for those type of algorithms or what is still lacking, to which extent we need a theoretical foundation and maybe to which extent not. From my perspective, in particular when it comes to sensitive applications like healthcare sector or to legal issues, I mean, I like very much what Stephen Hawking said. He said the greatest enemy of knowledge is not ignorance, it is the illusion of knowledge. And I think in this field of interpretability, this is something which is really crucial. What do we really know? What do we need to know? Uh, and so there are certainly different opinions. Um, also, different communities have different, let's say, understanding of what the theory is. But I think it is very important to be in a dialogue about this, about what we actually need to know about these type of algorithms, and to be also open, say, to other communities and other opinions on this important, to my mind, very important issue. Good, so let me start with um, just a couple of slides, what I think are necessary theoretical foundations for deep neural networks, to give them a really deep understanding and um, make them, in some sense, then also safe for sensitive applications. Now, deep neural networks are actually a very mathematical object. I mean, they're in its purest form, if you have a feed-forward neural network, there are just a highly structured function. Right? So just a function from Rd to R in L, or maybe R1, if I have a classification decision. And they are highly structured functions, so roughly composed of f and linear maps, Ax plus b, and these activation functions, which are nonlinear univariate functions. 
Ah, and so there are important components which people are very interested in, the number of layers, the number of neurons, in particular the number of neurons in each of those layers. Good, so what do we need to know or what do we want to know about those um, type of functions? For this, let me go through a training process and then we will see naturally which areas and which directions are important to pursue in general. Okay, so we have our sample samples from some function. We have a complicated function in the background on a manifold, maybe classification decision, and we have our sample values. So what do we do? Well, I mean, we first decide which network to choose. Uh, and there it already starts. For instance, for inverse problems, if you use neural networks, you typically use a unit, which is a convolutional neural network with a particular structure. Therefore, it's called unit. But nobody knows why a unit is good for inverse problems or even maybe the optimal neural network for this. Uh, so there, I mean, I think a big open question is which architectures are actually maybe for certain problem classes important. Uh, so we have to decide how many layers to take, how many neurons in each layer. We maybe pre-select some of these entries of the matrix to be equal to zero, to not have a fully connected network, to, to have already a very precise structure, which then makes also the training process easier. Then it comes to learning. Uh, so then we train our neural network, we solve this uh, minimization problems, so we minimize this functional, where we have a loss function, we, which gives us the distance of my neural network in the sample values to the sample values I have. Maybe I regularize also. And when I do everything correctly, I get my weights. And this gives me the neural network. Oh, and so this is done by stochastic gradient descent. But as you all know, also that's a wide open field. Does it convert? What are good initial values for this algorithm? Maybe there are other algorithms which are more stable. All this is not known. Ah, and then the last point, generalization. Ah, so now I have done everything hopefully right. Then I'm wondering how close am I now on my complete manifold to my function f, which I want to learn. Ah, so do I, how does it perform on outer sample data? And also there, what one saw, that is statistical learning theory somehow might be not able with current methods to explain the generalization ability of deep neural networks. Yeah, and so this leads to what I think are important theoretical directions which uh, need to be pursued and solved. So there's the area of expressivity in mathematics, which would, we would say approximation. How powerful is a network architecture? Can it represent the correct functions? Maybe I have, let's say, a general problem class, inverse problems. Why do I take units? Are these the best networks I can take? Or maybe they're stabler ones. Yeah, and so there goes a lot of applied harmonic analysis, approximation theory, and so on to solve those questions. Then there's the next area, learning. Yeah, so I have um, my learning algorithm, which are starting values. Does the learning algorithm converge? Does it, is it stable? They are very interesting approaches. Also using uh, optimal control, for instance, nowadays, differential geometry optimization. And then the general area of generalization. Now, so why does it perform good on out of sample data? Maybe which impact has the depth of the neural network? Because this is now what actually also enables us to have these amazing results, that we can train deep neural network. But it is not clear comprehensively why the depth is such an important factor for um, the training. Ah, and so their learning theory, optimization, statistics, and so on plays a fundamental role. So these three areas are exactly also the areas, if you view this as a statistical learning problem, where the error of that is composed of the approximation error, the optimization error, and then the sampling error. And so there's a lot of theory lacking. And then there's the area of interpretability, which is a bit separate. I mean, one can argue that if, let's say, we have a complete understanding of all the other three parts, maybe we don't even need interpretability. But still, I mean, we will always come in the situation that we have a fixed neural network, which we get from somewhere. We don't have any control on how it is trained, and then we need to inter interpret it. Ah, so there are questions are, why did a neural network reach a certain decision? Which components are important? 
Uh, and so this talk will be about this uh, last area here. Good. So let's let's start. Um, neural networks. I think classification is a very crucial task for neural networks and also a very classical task for neural networks. Now, so the questions one want to answer there is: We have a decision of our neural network. What features are relevant for this? Yeah, and so this could mean a lot of things. We can treat each pixel separately. This is what's, what's usually done. But we can also, for instance, think about combinations of pixels. Maybe not every pixel itself has a certain relevance, but maybe a combination of it is very relevant. Also incorporating additional knowledge. And then there was also, when Klaus gave his talk, the comment, what about, let's say, something which is not in the image? something which is missing, that might be actually also important for the decision. And then we can also ask, for instance, how certain is the decision? Yeah, so all those are important aspects of understanding a decision of a neural network. Um, right now, algorithms are typically in the first range, so to treat pixels separately and put a heat map on. Ah, and so we saw such images already in Klaus talk, and I think he gave a really uh, amazing introduction to this area and also explains this in, in detail, just to recall this. So what does this mean? Um, roughly speaking, so if I would like to classify this uh, as a three, then the, so these are typically called relevance maps. So each pixel has a certain color and the more red it is, the more relevant it is for the decision. So here, for instance, for the three, uh, so these areas are very important because if they would be closed, it would not be a three, but they are open. Uh, and so also this part here. These parts are not that um, favorable for the decision because these kind of indicate that maybe this is, it is not a three. Uh, and so vice versa, classifying this as an eight, then certainly these areas are actually very bad because they are open, and so they speak against this being an eight, but these parts are favorable. Uh. But then always, I think, one has to ask, I mean, is this sufficient knowledge about a network decision? I mean, I don't want to allude too much into that direction, but I think this is, uh, in particular in this area, um, key to ask yourself whether what you have is already sufficient. Now, there has been a lot of results in this area um, using different directions. For instance, gradient-based methods. We've worked on this for a long time, then backpropagation. Um, based methods, and so this is also the work by Klaus Robert Müller, which he presented in the morning talk, surrogate model-based networks, uh, methods, and also game theoretic methods. Good. So the main goal in all these methods is to understand decision of a back box predictor, and these methods use relevance maps. Uh, so these are relevance maps or heat maps, as it was also mentioned by one of the participants in the morning. So the challenges I see there is the question, what exactly is relevance in a mathematical sense? Yeah, so you say one pixel uh, has, I don't know, the color red. It is relevant for the decision, but what does it precisely mean? And then also, what is a good relevance map? And maybe what is an optimal relevance map? Yeah, so if you know exactly what relevance means, then we can also talk about a good relevance map or a better relevance map or an optimal relevance map. And that also should give us a meaning of comparison, of a fair comparison between relevance maps. So for the, second, for the first question, um, what I would like to discuss in this talk is a rigorous definition of what relevance means in terms of information theory. That allows us to then formulate interpretability as an optimization problem. So this gives us also a notion of better, a good, and optimal relevance map. And it also allows us to drive a theoretical analysis of the complexity of this problem. And last but not least, we will also get a canonical framework for comparison of different methods. So let's start very slowly. So what is this relevance mapping problem? That's the setting. I have a classification function. Doesn't need to be a network right now. It's just a function from 0, 1 to d, so from the unit square, d, d cube. 
two, zero, one. And I have an input signal. Yeah? And so I could maybe classify this as a monkey. I classify this as being not a monkey. So what, do I would, what would I like to do? I would like to now identify the most relevant pixels for this decision. And what I would like to do right now is I would like to say a pixel is either relevant or not relevant. Yeah, so I have my original image here, x. Then the relevant components will be always denoted by capital S, and it will be a subset of this image, yeah, a subset of pixels. It doesn't need to be connected. It could also be, let's say, one part here, one part here. And then the complement of this, so S complement, will be the non-relevant pixels. Yeah? Okay. Good. So how, how do we define relevance now? So this is in terms of, as I said, rate distortion, or information theory, and then rate distortion. So what is the philosophy behind this? Now, rate distortion theory is the following. You have a, a sender, typically called Alice. You have someone who receives it, typically called Bob. And Alice sends something to Bob. She wants to send as few pixels or whatever you send as possible. That's the rate. But by also minimizing the distortion, so by minimizing the error. Yeah, so you want to send as few as possible, but want to also keep the error under control. So and we want to formulate this problem here now in terms of this rate distortion framework. OK, so here's basically everything um, what the idea is. So we have Alice and Bob. As I said, Alice sends something to Bob. She wants to send as few as possible, but so that the distortion is still small. Now, let's assume Alice has phi, my function phi, which is a neural network, and Bob has the same phi. Now, Alice has this image x, and what she would like to do is, yeah, so which is classified as a monkey, she would like to transfer or transmit as few pixels to Bob as possible. Yeah, so these are the relevant pixels. She transmits them to Bob, so a subset of the image, so that Bob still recognizes this as, in that case, a monkey. Now, Bob has a problem at this point. Why? Because Bob just gets a couple of pixels. He cannot put this in his neural network. Ah, you can only pick, put an image in the neural network. So what he must, needs to do, he needs to fill the missing pixels up. Ah, and so the, let's say the best you can do is you just fill them up randomly. Because that's, I mean, with highest probability gives you, let's say, the least distortion. If you would fill it, let's say, with a uniform color, it could actually distort the image. Good. So he takes, he gets these pixels, he fills it up with random pixels. And then he puts this in his neural network, and then hopefully he gets the same decision. Yeah, so this is, yes? I think the, the thing that's always seemed odd to me here is that that image that Bob now has yeah. is totally off the training manifold, right? Because he's never seen an image with random noise in it, right? And so it seems like the model could do anything at that point, right? Why should we think that the model with random noise pixels is like the output, you know? You see what I'm saying? Because it's so it's off the training manifold. Yeah, I mean the philosophy is here as I mean, we want to identify what relevant pixels are. And so here, um, independent, I mean, so so this phi, I mean just think of phi not a neural network, just just any function right now. Yeah, and so yeah, so we would like to explain that a subset of this is still, let's say, recognized in the same way. But if we have a subset, we need to, let's say, fill it in. And you can do, do it in different ways. I mean, there might be better ways than random noise. I agree with you. But I mean, if you don't have any knowledge about phi, anything, I mean, then to some extent, the best you can do is to fill it in with random pixels if you want to pursue this strategy. There might be a better way if you have, let's say, as I say, more knowledge on phi. There might be a better way to complement this. But in case you don't know anything about phi, it's just an arbitrary function, then Filling it with random pixels seems to be the best. OK, good. So this, so what you see here is, I mean, the rate at which transmit, at which S transmits is the number of pixels in S. And then the distortion is the difference between these decisions. Yeah, and so the idea is you would like to transmit as few relevant pixels as possible so that the error is also still under control. Yeah, so in this sense, relevance means 
these, let's say, the most important pixels so that the classification decision doesn't change too much. Uh, and so the components here are the original image X and the completion Y. So Bob then has a random vector Y, which on S is equal to X and which in the complement is equal to, well, I mean, some, some noise vector. There could be different ways, but I mean, let's, let's stick with this. Good. So, so that's the idea. This is copied from the previous slide. So now the distortion, as I said, is we take phi of x minus phi of y. So that's the difference between what Alice sees and Bob. And then we take the expected value of this. This is our distortion. And then the rate distortion function is you would like to keep the distortion under control, less or equal than epsilon. But you would like to minimize the rate, which is the number of pixels we transmit, the number of relevant pixels. Yeah, so here, in some sense, we also aim for having few random pix irrelevant pixels. Ah, so this is the rate distortion function depending on epsilon. So this, in our sense, is, is a mathematical definition of what relevance could mean. Ah, and we will see numerical examples also later on on this. Now, if you would like to compute this, Per se, like we stated it here, we actually have a problem. Because computing this is very hard, and this we can prove. Now, but I mean, don't be too disappointed. We can relax this later on, and then we can actually uh, get, I think, very nice numerical results. But now, per se, this rate distortion function is finding the minimizer very hard. So finding the minimal, let's say, number of relevant pixels in this sense. So what can we show? Well, I mean, we can show that it is hard in a certain special case of neural networks. And this special case is classifiers in the binary setting. That's a special case of neural networks. And we can uh, just easily explain this. So every Boolean function you can formulate as a neural network and uh, also as a network with ReLU activation functions. So this setting is a special case of a neural network. And so if it's hard in this setting, then it will be hard in neural networks in general. Yeah, so in that sense, I mean, my pixels are now just, uh, my signals are now just a d-dimensional vector with zero and one entries, so binary combination, and then um, I take a uniform distribution for the noise. And then we can show just um, uh, very, just stating the results, we can show that finding a minimizer of R of epsilon is hard, it's even NPPP complete, and even finding an approximation of this is NP hard. Now, NP hard, I guess, I mean, most of you know, NPPP complete, um, that's a complexity class which comes from artificial intelligence. It is basically, if you plan under uncertainties, so you have, let's say, a very precise plan, you have some random behavior and your aim for the success probability, then this leads to this um, complexity class. Good, so this shows that, let me go back, what yeah, just finding, finding a minimizer of this for an epsilon is impossible to compute. Good. Okay, so we have a mathematical framework, but we cannot compute it. Now, what do people usually do? Well, we relax things. Ah, and so this leads to our method, which we call rate distortion explanation. Good. So that's the setting we have right now. Ah, so we have a relevant set of pixels. We have this obfuscation, so this image Y, where we have um, part from X and filled with random pixels. We have the distortion and then the rate, which is the number of pixels in my relevant set. Now we relax it by going to the continuous problem. So now, instead of just picking certain pixels, we give each pixel a value between 0 and 1. Ah, so then the obfuscation can be also formulated in this way. The distortion is then a distortion depending on S. It's exactly the same. Um, and the rate is now not just not the number of pixels, but the little l1 norm of the vector S. Ah, and so this leads then to the following minimization problem. What you want to do is you want to minimize the distortion plus lambda. So we regularize with the l1 norm on S. Subset, subject does that S is in a vector um, between, with entries between 0 and 1. OK, 
OK, so this is what we would like to solve now. Yeah, and so then we get our vector s which then should give us the relevant pixels and the non-relevant pixels also weighted between 0 and 1. So the distortion we can easily compute in this way. So we have here the covariance matrix, the expected value. Now, the expected value of y we can actually easily compute. So y was the image which Bob had. The covariance of y we can also compute. We have a slight problem now because we actually need the expected value and the covariance not of y, but of phi of y. OK, so what, what do we do? Well, we need to get from these values to these values here. How can we do that? Well, we can sample um, if we don't have any, let's say, information about phi. Um, but here we actually have more information. In fact, we have a neural network which have a, has a very, uh, very precise structure, as I said in the beginning. So it's a highly structured function with different layers. So now what we can do is we can take the expected value and the covariance and we can pass it through the different layers one by one. Good. So let's, let's do that. Um, yeah, so let's assume I have a normal distribution, I want to pass it through one layer. When I pass it to the F1 linear map, I don't have a problem. I get again a normal distribution. I get a problem now when I apply the ReLU because that cuts out a part. It's not a normal distribution anymore. But then I take the closest moment matching distribution to that. Ah, and so then I, I keep going and I pass through the feed forward neural network to get then, if I go back, to get then these values. Yeah, it was this the distortion which I need for computing my minimization problem. OK, good. So let's look at some numerical experiments. The first is on MNIST. So, well, it always works like we have a fixed neural network, which is already trained, which we don't know which training data was used. It's just there. Um, so in that case, we take um, a neural network which has a test accuracy of 99.1%. And we input here a 6. And what you see here are the relevance maps of the different um, approaches, or not all different approaches, but uh, from each class approaches. Yeah, sensitivity, backpropagation, um, game theoretic, surrogate model base, and then our approaches. So how can you interpret this now? Well, you can say, OK, I mean, this area is important because it kind of it is not closed. So it distinguishes a 6 from an 8. Ah, and also, maybe this area is important here. But again, I mean, this is only based on, let's say, visual um, interpretation. We would like to compare it in a fair way. But now we already have a fair way by our framework to some extent. Because what we can do now is we can compare the rate with the distortion. Yeah, so this is the size of the relevant pixels, and this is the error which we make. And certainly what you would like to see is you would like to see this curve going down very quickly, yeah, because you would like to get the distortion as fast as possible down. Yeah, but in a sense, I mean, this is also in a sense, similar to the comparison measure which Klaus in the morning talked about. Now with this pixel flipping test. Yeah, so this also has this random uh, behavior in. Now, what you see here is that the methods, the method RDE which we developed goes down the fastest. Yeah, and maybe the slowest is this guide, guided back problem. Now, so in that sense, you can view this as a comparison between different methods. Yes. So here I don't randomize the components. So here I, I take, I take the rate. Yeah, so you can, I mean, so you can view this as, um, so you have your, you you have you, you sorry sorry, you, so you have your your relevant pixels, yeah, and so then you take let's say the the, the twenty relevant pixels, then the thirty relevant pixels, and so on. Yeah. Sorry. So. No, no, 
given by the particular method. Yeah, 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 yeah. okay, sorry, yeah, so I should make that clear. Yeah. Okay, good, so let's make, let's look at a, a bit more complicated example, STL10. Again, we take a fixed neural network, um, now with a test accuracy of 93.5%, and we take this image of a dog, and you see now the heat maps here again of these different approaches. You see in some sense that our approach kind of, um, yeah, it is also tuned towards giving uh, small relevance maps in the sense of having small, a small number of relevant pixels with still a minimal distortion. And so what it does in some sense, it aims to kind of outline the, let's say, key part in the sense uh, looking at the face of the dog and also a bit of the structure here. And again, if you compare now, you see that our method also goes down the fastest here, then, I mean, it stays a bit at that level. That also depends on the fact that we have this regularization parameter lambda. And certainly you can tune this. But here for these experiments, certainly it is fixed. But I mean, if you aim for, let's say, a different rate, you would tune the regularization parameter. Good. So. Ah, so this was for, yes. All the experiments were for the, 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 continuous, for the continuous relaxation of this problem? So this is the continuous relaxation. Right. It, does, it, does this change dramatically if you force it, if you sort of binarize it at some point and you know, pick some threshold and, and put it in or out? Because you can still calculate the same metrics for a binarized frame. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we only take the continuous version. So we don't take the other version because this is uh, infeasible to compute. So here, what we do is we take, I mean, if you go back, we, we, we compute this. Um, yeah, so this comes from the continuous problem. So this is what we compute, and this is what you saw before in the, in the experiments. The, the rate, the distortion, given a binarized? Oh, yeah, yeah, you do the thresholding. You do the thresholding. Yeah, yeah, that is right. Yeah, 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 exactly. Exactly. OK. OK, so good. So this was for? Classification decisions. Uh, so what I what I showed you is that I mean one approach to um, understand what relevance actually means to give it a meaning now using information theory, um, and the meaning we give it is a rate distortion meaning. Uh, so you aim for the number of pixels, a minimal number of pixels which have the least distortion in this sense, which I explained by transmitting the signals and then filling them up. But certainly, I mean, neural networks are also used in a lot of other settings. Uh, I mean, and typically what is done in these cases is usually neural networks are not used just purely, but combining them with, let's say, physical-based models. Uh, and so in that direction, I mean, what is important and what also we found out in our research is to optimally balance the data-driven and model-based approach. Uh, and so there are different settings. For instance, um, in particular, inverse problems. It's also in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, sorry, inverse problems and imaging sciences. Um, that's also an area I come from, and that's actually also how I came about deep neural networks the first time. Because in this area, maybe three years ago or four years ago, uh, neural networks were starting to be used for imaging sciences applications, like no denoising, like super resolution, and so on. And after a few months or maybe after a year, 80% of the talks at those conferences are already using machine learning and deep learning methods. Uh, so there are typically, I mean, neural networks are used in combination with also model-based approaches. Then there's the area of numerical analysis of partial differential equations, which was a bit slower to embrace. Why? Because in imaging sciences, you don't even have a precise model what an image is. I mean, there are various models, but I mean, it's very difficult to model a natural image. Whereas for numerical PDEs, I mean, there you have a very precise physical model. You know exactly what you are doing. Still in this area, neural networks are also now used with great success, in particular in the high dimensional settings, where you have a curse of dimensionality. And neural networks are then, to some extent, shown to beat this curse of dimensionality. Ah, and so then also in the area of modeling now, there are approaches to um, use neural networks to replace, let's say, uh, uh, modeling by hand. Now, in all those, as I said, neural networks are used, and you can ask the question, if there are still a black box, what do you actually need to know 
to interpret the results correctly. And let me, in the last with 10 minutes, yeah, um, show you two of the um, applications we worked on and then discuss with you what interpretability in this case could mean. Now, because in these areas, I mean, interpretability is basically not studied right now. Interpretability usually is for classification. Uh, but I mean, also in this area, I think it's very important to understand how neural networks act there, um, depending on the application. Good, so the first application I would like to discuss comes from inverse problems. And that's, uh, in some sense, a classical problem. It's called limited angle computed tomography. What it is is um, the Radon transform computes, if you have a body, it computes line integrals through the body. Uh, and it gets, gets one function. This gives you a slice here, and then you rotate this. Yeah, so like a CT scanner, I mean, hopefully none of you had already experienced this in a hospital, but I mean, this is what it does. Uh, so it rotates and computes always these line integrals. And from this, you aim to recover the body. But now, the problem starts if you can only acquire data in a certain range, and you cannot do the full sweep. You cannot do 180 degrees. And then the problem is if you recover that in certain parts, the reconstruction is very blurry. And model-based methods are not able to resolve this problem. So if you use a pure model-based method because it's just impossible to model a human body accurately, you will always get this recovery where you have some blurry parts. But then, I mean, deep neural networks give you an edge and help you on this task. And so, for instance, what we did there was we just roughly speaking, we used the model-based methods as far as possible, and then used for what remained, what we cannot do otherwise, a neural network. And then we combined both. So to be a bit more precise on this, um, so what we first did, we solved a minimization problem, Tikhonov regularization was a sparsity term, which I don't want to go too much into the details there. If you know what wavelets, we use shearlets, which is a further development of this with an L1 term, so you get your solution, which is blurry. Yeah, so you see the reconstruction is blurry here and blurry here. Then we use, again, a transform, a shear transform, and this decomposes the data into a part which is already reliable and perfect, and another part which is almost zero. And only for that part, we then use a neural network to fill this part in, and then combine both sides. So that's the idea. And so this is what, what you can see then. I mean, this is the original image. This is a very crude reconstruction. So you have here a 60 degree missing angle. This is, in some sense, the best you can do with a model-based method. So where we have a very precise mathematical model, you see these blurry parts. This is from colleagues in South Korea who used a neural network on the entire image. So not a model-based approach, but just on the entire image. And then if you combine both worlds, in some sense, combine your networks with model-based approaches, this is what you can do. But now you can ask, I mean, how, how do you actually interpret such a result? Or what does actually interpret interpretability mean in this case? Now, what you might want to know is you might want to know how uncertain or how certain is the recon reconstruction in certain areas. Yeah, so here, I mean, a relevance map doesn't make any sense. It's not a classification. But what you might want to know is you might want to know how certain is the algorithm, so the inversion, in certain areas. Because if you have a tumor there, you would like to know if the network just invented it or not. So here, interpretability means, or also validation, could mean putting not a relevance map, but an uncertainty map on here, and understanding which pixels are how certain and which are unre unreliable. Yeah, it could also mean consistency. If you have this reconstruction, you apply again your forward operator, you would like to get your results, I mean, you would like to get your measurements back. So it is consistent in a sense. Then you can talk about explanation. Yeah, so I mean, interpretability always has these aspects of, or it's also Klaus discussed, validation of the result. Think of these horses with the label. But it also has the second aspect of explaining the result. And this is very difficult to make, to formalize, uh, because that depends very much on the observer, on the, on the goal you would like to have. 
So here, for instance, you can have, for instance, your goal could be to decide whether the patient has cancer or not. That would be a classification decision, and then we are back in the other setting. It could also mean, in the end, you would like to compress this image. That's a very different setting. Huh? And so and then you can also ask, how good is the network actually doing in this respect? So in, if you use a neural network um, for inverse problems, I think the point, the key point is there. I mean, relevance maps and so don't make any sense. If you would then like to talk about interpretability, you need to think differently. For instance, here in terms of uncertainties. The other area which I would like to mention briefly is numerical analysis of partial differential equations, which is now kind of accelerating since maybe two or three years. There's, and these are all, I should stress that, just samples. There are a lot of other papers out there. So let me show you also one, one example there, um, what people do or what we did also there, um, which is in the setting of parametric PDEs, so parameter-dependent families of PDEs. Uh, so these are usually used for optimization tasks, for also design optimization. You have certain parameters, and you would like to optimize them and each time have to solve a PDE. So what you usually have is a setting like this. You have a differential operator. You have Y, which is a parameter. You have a right-hand side, which also depends on the parameter, and the solution depends on the parameter as well. Uh, and so then given Y, you would like to compute the solution. And the key problem is that you need to do that many times. Uh, so you need to, many times, given a parameter value, compute the solution. Uh, and so the problem here is that this could be in a very high dimensional setting, so key, P could be very large. And so then that's one of these cases where you face this curse of dimensionality. And as I said, in this area, typically deep neural networks are used to beat this curse of dimensionality. That's, in a way, one, one main um, reason why they then suddenly became that seeked after and successful. And so for instance, what, what you can do here is um, what we did is we analyzed whether you can replace this parametric map by a neural network with the ReLU activation function. And what we could show is that the size, the complexity of this, activa of this, of this um, neural network does not suffer from this curse of dimensionality. Yeah, so we can compute this map by a neural network where the size, the complexity in terms of the number of uh, parameters does not depend exponentially on this p. Uh, and so we can write this explicitly down. But certainly then you can ask the question, so this shows such a network exists and of this type are most of the results in this area. But then you can also ask, now I have a neural network and I train it to compute this parametric map do I get something reasonable? Right? And so this again leads to the question of this training procedure. Now you get a black box and you would like to interpret this. Good. Ah, so I mean, as I said, I mean, so this leads to a very fast computation of the parametric map. Good. So here, interpretability in a sense could also mean different things. It could mean uh, understanding whether this parametric map, which I now compute by this. Um, by this neural network, how certain this is. Ah, so in the Bayesian sense, does it approximate my parametric map? Now, explanation doesn't make that much sense here, because you have this fixed setting, this fixed physical setting, and you replace your parametric map now by a neural network, so it's mainly what you need to do, validation of the results. Ah, so there's not much, much interpretability or uh, explanation now um, what you can pursue there. Good, so I think I'm almost out of time. Um, let me stop with some conclusions. Um, deep learning, in my sense, I mean, has impressive performances. I showed you a couple of examples also for inverse problems and partial differential equations, but the theory is largely, I mean, there is interesting theory, don't understand me wrong, but I mean, I think a comprehensive theory is uh, still entirely missing. Uh, and so I argue that there are four areas where it's would be interesting to pursue um, studies, theoretical studies, expressivity, learning, generalization, and this area of interpretability. Now, for interpretability, the question we discussed here is, I mean, if I have uh, a classification network, typically people use relevance maps for 
understanding this, so if you have a classification decision, you would like to understand which pixels are most relevant for this decision and what our goal was to give this, let's say, a precise meaning, what relevance means. We did that in a rate distortion framework or in general information theoretic framework by, uh, by aiming for finding a subset of the pixels so that you can transmit it but still recognize this in the same sense. But then we saw that exactly the pure setting is, is hard to compute, but a relaxed version works. So this leads to this rate distortion explanation which we introduced. And also, I think the um, numerical results show that in particular for smaller rates, this outperforms other methods. Good, and with this I'd like to conclude and thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>